to the Neurologic Wellness Podcast. It's Dr. Joe here with my guest, Dr. Matthew Shem. Thank you for being here today. You bet. Thanks for having me. Of course. Uh, now, Dr. Shem, uh, today I believe we are talking about autoimmunity, uh, generally what that is, and also how that is relevant to brain health. Um, but before we jump into that topic specifically, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background? Sure. So um, my story kind of starts in junior high when I had a weightlifting accident and I hurt my low back and I went to go see this Cairo and from there he got me feeling better pretty quickly. And so it was from there on, I kind of decided all through junior high and high school that this is what I wanted to do, be a chiropractor. Um, and then after I graduated high school, I went back and kind of shadowed him for a day and just kind of made sure it was really what I wanted to do. And at the time he was just diving into the neurology side of things. And I thought, wow, this stuff is actually really interesting. So Long story short, I ended up working for him and um, I was kind of like in the rehab department and it was in that moment that I thought, you know, I think I really want to pursue this neurology stuff a little bit further. And it was also at that time being like, you know, 18 or 19, I was in the rehab department and he was just adjusting people all day and watching him from afar. I, I told myself, you know, at 18, 19, I know I can't do that forever. That being just like, it's just walking back and forth from room to room, just adjusting people. There's just not enough thought process or, or mental stimulation for me to be enticed to want to go back to work every day. And so I think that that in itself has been one of my big driving factors in why today my practice is pretty much mainly functional neurology and functional medicine. So that's me. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense because uh, you have to put a lot of thought into just about yeah. every patient that, uh, we typically see. So sure. I'm sure you're, you're excited to get to work every day because of that. <laughs> um, so autoimmunity is the topic of discussion today. Um, you see this in your practice a lot. Can you tell us a little bit about what autoimmunity is in general? Sure. So before we get really too far into it, I just want to say for one, thanks so much for having me on here, Joe. It's a real pleasure. Um, uh, there's been a lot of people that you've interviewed on this podcast who I kind of look up to in this space of healthcare, and so it's a real, real honor to be able to share this stage and hopefully, you know, share something that is of value to your audience. So, um, tying into autoimmunity, autoimmunity, um, just basic, what it is is when our immune system mistakes its own healthy tissue as a foreign invader, and so our own immune system now starts attacking our own tissue, and. The important thing to realize is that this is an uncurable condition. And so with uncurable conditions, there will be, there are times where this condition can be put into remission. And with anything that goes into remission, there can now be relapses, right? And flare ups. And so the whole goal, I think, whenever treating somebody with an autoimmune condition is to get them to a period where they're, for one, in remission, and then to where they're in remission for longer periods of time. And then that those flare ups, um, aren't so bad and not lasting that long because the reality is that you're going to have a flare up because with autoimmune conditions, there's so many different things. And that's kind of one thing that I want to talk about in today's topic is just like all the different triggers um, because they could be just really trivial things, or it could be stuff like, let's say you had a family member die. Let's say you have a stressful week at the, at, at work. Maybe you're undergoing an audit at the IRS, or it could be just a bunch of small little things. Like maybe you woke up and you started your morning off with some hot coffee from Starbucks and you drank it through that lid that's got BPA all in it. And then for dinner, you went and had, uh, you know, some accidental exposure to gluten and your food was a little bit salted. So those are kind of all the different things that I think about when just uh, over talking about the broad concept of autoimmunity and the idea behind treating it. Mm -hmm. And uh, how might somebody develop uh, an autoimmune condition? You know, the, long, yeah. the list is so long on the different uh, types, but uh, just in general, I guess. Yeah, so just there's, there's kind of three different stages of autoimmunity. One being the first stage where that's where you'll see elevated antibodies, but the patient won't have any symptoms. Then whenever you get into stage two, you'll see elevated antibodies on blood work. They'll start feeling uh, symptomatic, but there won't be any destruction of tissue. So let's say, for example, you have rheumatoid arthritis 
there will be no destruction of your joints. But then when you get to stage three, you get elevated antibodies, you start feeling symptomatic, and you start getting destruction of tissue. Um, and that's whenever you'll see like people with rheumatoid arthritis, they got these crazy looking hands that are all mangled and flared up and stuff like that. And I think it's really important to monitor the different stages because for one, um, like obviously the earlier we catch it, the better. And on top of that is like, if you're in stage one autoimmunity, you now don't have any symptoms, but you could still have this underlying thing going on. So I think it's really important to not only screen for like one autoimmune condition, but screen for a lot of them. And so I really like doing a test called Cyrex Array 5, which screens for like, um, I think 24 different um, antibodies for all kinds of different tissue. And with that, you can now monitor as somebody has various triggers and, and they're progressing further into, let's say stage two autoimmunity. So let's say, for example, you present with um, something and we do some testing and we find that you're in stage one um, type one diabetes, where now the islet cells of the antibody of the uh, pancreas are getting destroyed and now you can't produce enough insulin, right? Well, <clears throat> we can monitor that in the fact that like now when you start noticing you feel symptomatic and you start noticing insulin resistant type symptoms. So let's say you feel tired after your meals or you're craving sugar after you eat, stuff like that. Those are more insulin resistant type symptoms. And now you can say to yourself, whatever I did today that led me to feeling like that, I don't want to do as much of that in the future because it caused a progression of my autoimmune disease. Because the reality is that whenever we eat, we really shouldn't feel any different change in how we feel. The only thing that we should notice after we eat is we should not be hungry anymore. So that's kind of um, the broad overview of, you know, testing and then and looking for different triggers. And then, you know, there's a bunch of different triggers after that, you know. Okay. Um, and then once you've identified that somebody may have uh, on autoimmunity as a component of their um, symptomatology, how do you then go about addressing it? What are the different variables you have to consider? Yeah. So I think the most, I think when it comes to autoimmune conditions, it's very, very personalized. And so I think that this is one aspect of why I really, really enjoy um treating these types of cases. And I think this is one thing that tied me to the functional neurology side too, in the fact that they're just like, just like um, somebody presenting with a head injury, there is no two head injuries that are alike, right? And so the same thing applies for autoimmunity and the fact that all, everybody's care needs to be personalized. And so I think one of the most important factors is various foods and, and dietary proteins that can lead to an autoimmune trigger. So, um, why that's important is let's say, for example, well, let's, let's just say whenever you have an autoimmune condition, the likelihood that you will have a, some sort of food um, sensitivity and food susceptibility is very, very high. And so one thing that we have to monitor for is just how you break down your, uh, your food and like your digestive process in general, because for one, let's say I ingest whatever it may be. I eat this burger and that let's say that beef, that beef patty whenever I ingest it, it's in this form of a, a, a long protein sequence, right? And so that long protein sequence is a, a list of, let's say, 50 amino acids, 50 letters, right? And what we need to do is our digestive system needs to um, break that down so that we can break down that long sequence of proteins into individual amino acids. And the reason that's important is because our immune system can only tag things that are in that long protein sequence. So whenever things get broken down into this uh, short amino acid sequence, where it's just individual letters versus this long chain of letters, our immune system can't tag it. So that's really important and monitoring people for like bloating or gas or abdominal distension to basically know if that's happening, you're not breaking down your food. Another important thing is um, something called molecular mimicry, which this was really, really eye-opening to me um, when I got started studying more of this autoimmune stuff because the reality is that there's like a lot of gurus out there in the nutrition space and in really every space that think that you know this this one product or service is just beneficial to everybody right and so um there are a lot of people that say like everybody should be on this one diet or the only thing that matters is calories in versus calories out and the reality is that everything should be personalized to that unique individual, right? And so something that was really eye-opening for me in regards to this is you can have um, 
molecular mimicry towards something called aquaporin-4, aquaporin-4 being these water channels in our central nervous system. And aquaporin-4 cross-reacts with foods like soy, tomato, spinach, and corn. And so if you take definitely two of those foods, spinach and tomato, and you ask just the general public, do you think that spinach and tomato would be just part of a healthy diet? Most people would probably say yes, right? And for people with autoimmune reactions or antibodies towards aquaporin-4, now when they eat that spinach or tomato or corn and soy, when they eat that thing, that protein sequence, sequence looks a lot like aquaporin-4. So now our immune system not only tags that food, but it also tags this aquaporin-4, that water channel in our own healthy tissue. And that can lead to things like um, neuromyelitis optica, where people have uh, demyelination of like the optic nerves and they become, they can get blindness and paralysis and all this other stuff. And same thing with like gluten. Gluten can tag um, different things like transglutaminase 6 in the cerebellum. And so now people can develop things like gluten ataxia, where, you know, their balance and their, and their coordination becomes really bad just from the ingestion of gluten, because that gluten looks like structures of the cerebellum or, um, something called GAD65. Gluten looks a lot like something called GAD65, which takes the, which converts glutamate into GABA. And so now you can have people develop like OCD type symptoms or type one diabetes from these different things. So I think it's, it's really interesting, right? Um, and then a couple more things in regards to food is that uh, a lot of people who have an autoimmune condition are just managed by somebody kind of dabbles in and functional medicine is they'll put them on a really, really restrictive diet and they'll do like all these food sensitivity testing, right? So I'm sure that you've seen it in your office, people come in with all these different, you know, uh, paperwork and stuff that they've had from other providers and they have food sensitivity testing stuff and done. And it, the reality is that most of that food sensitivity testing, unless otherwise stated, is tested in the raw form. So you'll see somebody come back and they'll won't be eating um, let's say bacon, chicken, and eggs because it came back on their food sensitivity test. But who do you know of? I know it's not me. Who eats raw bacon and raw chicken and raw eggs? I mean, not many people do that. So these people, they may be not eating certain things because it came back on their food sensitivity test. But then the reality is that they may have that restricted from their diet and unnecessarily so. Same thing with, um, whenever foods are combined with other foods, the protein sequence changes. So they did this interesting study where they took like individual aspects of certain foods and they tested the, the, the uniqueness of it and how you reacted to certain things. So they did like, they did like fried chicken where they took like the batter and they tested that. And then they took the chicken and they tested that. And then they combined it and made fried chicken and they tested that. And they saw that like, if you just tested the batter alone, people had like a little minor reaction. And then if you tested just the chicken, they had a minor reaction. And then if you tested the fried chicken together, it was like this huge reaction. Same thing with mm -hmm. beer. They took like the hops, the barley and the rye and the individual things that didn't really have that bigger reaction. But when all these proteins come together, they change. And now they had this huge reaction whenever they actually have beer. Another thing too, in regard to like um, conditions that you and I see is we see a lot of head injuries, right? Mm -hmm. And people with head injuries, a lot of them present with dysautonomia and you'll see it a lot online and stuff like that, where a lot of people who are treating dysautonomia, they will make a recommendation um, for the ingestion of salt because salt, um, now water follows the salt and increases the blood volume and people feel less dizzy and all this other stuff. But they've actually done studies where salt can be an autoimmune trigger. So that's what I was talking about earlier. And so now for people like you and I, we have to kind of sit back and kind of play in our head and say, if this person is presenting to us, with a traumatic brain injury that induces this autoimmune mediated dysautonomia. Now we have to sit and think, does making the prescription of upping your salt intake really sound like the best idea? Cause it may lead to a flare. And luckily for us, they've also done studies where they kind of counterbalance the, that um, aspect of intaking salt with also taking potassium and it kind of balances things out. So it's kind of, you know, in our favor, another tool in our tool bag. Um, and then something else too, that is really fitting for um, the times that we're in right now is tomorrow is St. Patrick's Day. And so a lot of people spent this weekend drinking a lot of green 
fear, right? And <clears throat> the reality is that food coloring is really, really bad and can be a trigger for autoimmune conditions because like we talked about before is your immune system can only tag those protein sequences whenever they're, they're long. And what food coloring does is it doesn't allow for the breakdown of that protein sequence into individual amino acids. So now you have people drinking like this green colored beer and they can't break it down, which could be leading to all kinds of different symptoms, right? And then I think the last thing in regards to foods and probably one of the most important things is microbiome diversity. Um, and I think that this is really important, microbiome being just the, the bacteria in your gut. And I think that this is really, really important because like we talked about before, a lot of people that present with autoimmune conditions, they've seen other people and a lot of other providers, they'll just give them this like, you know, bag of supplements They'll put them on this really restrictive diet and just kind of hope that when I talk to them next, that they're feeling a little bit better. And the reality is that when you put people on this really restrictive diet, now it's really frustrating for the patient because they're only allowed to eat this handful of things, right? And so for them to make it easier, they might eat, end up eating the same thing every day. And why that's troublesome and problematic for people with um, autoimmune conditions is you need this diverse amount of uh, bacteria in the gut because, and particularly you get that diverse amount of bacteria from the gut from plant fibers. So eating a lot of different plant and vegetables, stuff like that is really good because that gut bacteria then releases short chain fatty acids, which activates T reg cells, which dampens down the immune response. So, um, I think that's kind of the big picture in regards to foods and, and how they're, they're really important. Yeah. And I just want to tell anyone listening, you should probably pause right here replay that section and then because that was a lot of information a lot of great information that you uh just supplied everyone with and i thought that was fantastic and cool. i have a lot of questions that i can uh, branch off from there from cool, cool. uh but the first one i guess uh you brought up tbi which goes into a broader question but um obviously not everyone is going to respond to uh, specific proteins the same as someone else, right? Sure. So considering things like TBI, considering things like genetics and environment, what are some, some reasons that person A might have more of an issue with say tomatoes than uh, person B or whatever it may be? Yeah, I think it's, I don't think we really know. I think that it has to do with just your genetic susceptibility. Um, like if let's say that your mother had some sort of autoimmune condition, now you not you may not never develop an autoimmune condition, but the likelihood that you are is greater. And then um, there are just all these different triggers that may lead to whatever happening. Maybe you have a leaky gut, maybe you have a traumatic brain injury that causes a leaky gut, maybe you have all these different things. And then I think it's just kind of for whatever reason, things attach. If you talked about spinach and, and tomato, that's attaching to aquaporin four. I think it's just kind of luck of the draw that things attach to um, you know, that aquaporin four versus versus attaching to uh, islet cells in the pancreas or, or um, rheumatoid factor, you know, all these different things. I think it's just kind of luck of the draw. Mm -hmm. yeah, of course. And then um, you mentioned uh, biodiversity and things like that. What, what are some ways that, um, that uh, we can, I guess, repopulate the gut or yeah. kind of get rid of some of that bad bacteria that uh, we tend to accumulate in our guts? Yeah. So what I really like doing is um, if you see a lot of people in the functional medicine space, um, they're really heavy on giving a lot of supplements, right? And so I think supplements are an important aspect of care, but by far in, in a way, not nearly the most important aspect. And I think um, dietary aspects and lifestyle changes are the most important things. So talking about the supplement side is giving short chain fatty acids like butyrate and stuff like that and acetate and all this other stuff. Those are really important. But what I really like doing is something called a vegetable mashup where you basically, I tell patients, just go to the store and buy a bunch of different um, vegetables chop them up, put them in the freezer. And then every morning, just grab a handful of that, put them in uh, your Vitamix and just mix it up and drink it. It's going to taste like dirt, but it's really the best thing that you can do um, to get a diverse amount of uh, bacteria into the gut. Because we, like we talked about is I die, whenever you say a diverse microbiome, we're not talking about you just having like a beef 
and chicken and pork and salmon, that's not what's going to give you this diverse microbiome. It's plant fibers. So getting a bunch of different types of vegetables. Yeah, very good. And uh, so when a, when a typical patient enters your office, what, what can they expect? Right? Yeah. What, what does a typical testing uh, look like for you? Yeah, so I think that's an important question. Um, I, whenever somebody presents to my office, first and foremost, I want to talk to them before they see me, before they actually schedule any visit with me. I want to just do a free phone consult and kind of screen them and say, I think I can help you or I think I can't. And if I think I can't, be able to direct them to you know somebody that I think can. And then whenever they do come in, if I do think I can help them, now it's kind of my, um, my job to figure out which route of care am I going to go down? And so <clears throat> if somebody is more recent off of a, a head injury or a head injury is something that kind of provoked all of their types of symptoms, that's going to lead me into thinking um, this is probably going to be more of a functional neurology rehab type case. And another thing, which I'm sure that you do in your office is during my exam, I like to challenge different things. So let's say that I do like a pinwheel and they don't, they don't notice it on their left side as much as their right. I'll tilt their head and see if we can change vestibular input or change neck input and stuff like that and see if it changes. And if we can make changes, then it's going to kind of give me the green light and say, okay, this patient is probably going to benefit the most from rehab versus a typical autoimmune patient. They're going to present with like, I've seen all these people, nobody's helped me. I have all these reactions to different foods. I have all these reactions, different chemicals and all these different things and nothing has helped me. And I've been struggling for decades and all these other things. And that right there is gonna make me say, okay, we're probably gonna be leaning more towards running some labs and then finding out, is this more metabolic? So it's kind of like, you know, a, a game of weighing out the pros and cons. And then I give every patient, um, I, I always tell people that, I'm kind of just like the, the, this, you're the one leading the ship as the patient and I'm just kind of navigating where we're going. And so I kind of give everybody the option is like, these are the pros of doing rehab. These are the pros of doing metabolic work. And some patients I say, I would recommend doing both. Um, but I mean, you know, everybody doesn't have an unlimited source of, of money. And so, you know, you have to kind of play the pros and cons of saying, you know, these are the benefits of this. These are the benefits of this. You kind of tell me, what do you want to do? Right. And I think that's our most important job as uh, yeah. clinicians is to just identify needs and then give our best and honest recommendation as to what we think is going to work best for that patient. Sure. Um, given an example of uh, somebody who has both maybe a neurological say, injury, like a TBI, right? Yeah. Or they also have maybe some autoimmunity underlying. Yeah. How have you found the, I guess, the prognosis or the progression of their care to be when they have both versus maybe just one? Yeah, that's an interesting question because I think this is something now looking back, I wish that I would have started learning this functional medicine stuff way more. Like I started learning the functional neurology stuff early in Cairo school and I didn't start learning the functional medicine stuff till after I got out of Cairo school. And the reality is that I really like doing functional neurology because you see changes so fast, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's easy for me. And like similar to your office, I see a lot of people that for intensives, right? So we see people for a week and we see them for a number of hours per day. And when you're doing that, you can see changes really, really fast. And it's easy on me now to be able to say, we did this exercise and based on what happened, it now led me to do this exercise, right? And we can monitor that. And it's really easy on me as the provider and also really rewarding for the patient because they're seeing things happen really, really fast, right? That's different when it comes to autoimmune conditions and handling somebody more metabolically because things don't happen really fast. And now it's on the patient to be able to monitor this progress because I'm not with them at home. I'm not with them whenever they're you know, um, dealing with all these various stressors to know like, you know, whatever happened, I didn't get enough sleep. And then I noticed this happened or something, something I really wanted to talk about is, um, stressors and, um, just like, just like everyday stress and how it can be a real big trigger for autoimmunity. This was something that was really eye opening for me. And the fact that, um, something as trivial as maybe arguing with your spouse, or maybe you had a bad day at work, you had a lack of sleep, and then also exercise. Exercise is really, really a, an interesting topic, kind of tying back to earlier about how everybody, everybody in the general public would probably assume, and probably a lot of healthcare providers would assume that the more exercise you get, the better you are, right? Well, that's not necessarily true when it comes to autoimmune conditions, and this was really eye-opening to me because, for one, 
when you have, when you exercise, you release opioids, which then activate T reg cells, which can dampen down the autoimmune response. But the longer you exercise in duration, the more you drive these pro-inflammatory pathways and it can lead you to having a trigger. And um, what they found is that the higher intensity you exercise can actually dampen down that immune response. So now it's kind of like this back and forth trial and error with the patient to be able to say, how long can I exercise? How intense can I exercise to lead to the best results for me, right? So, um, you know, I think it's just kind of, you know, a roundabout way of saying that it's, it's a lot more difficult. And it's, it's, I think that that's why um, that these patients are really underserved. And the fact that like, you know, healthcare is a big thing in America, a lot of people are sick. And with that, a lot of doctors are really busy. And so if you want to be kind of the standoff practitioner that just kind of gives them some supplements and say, I'll talk to you in the 30 days, it doesn't really work, you know, because there's so many different things that can be triggering to patient, patients with autoimmune conditions that things don't happen overnight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think you just highlighted it, a huge problem yet uh, solution that uh, practitioners like yourself can provide uh, this country and that, you know, there are so many complicated cases out there and medicine right now is not that individualized. And sure. you've highlighted point after point how important it is to be individualized from exercise to diet to um, rehab strategies. So I think uh, people who are struggling are going to benefit a lot from uh, visiting a clinic like yourself. Sure. Um, Dr. Shem, you also talked about stress, and I know that was definitely something you wanted to stress today, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so <laughs> How does stress actually affect uh, us from an autoimmune uh, yeah. standpoint and uh, maybe gut and brain and et cetera? Yeah. So I think that's kind of what I was talking about earlier mm -hmm. in regards to like, like lack of sleep. Um, I forget exactly the, the exact mechanism, but lack of sleep drives these like TH17 pathways, which then um, drive this pro-inflammatory um, aspect. And then it's really just kind of like trying to figure out um, how do we modulate the immune system so that we don't have an overactive side on one side or overactive side on the other. And so you have all these different things, whether it be maybe you have a toxic relationship around you, maybe you had a lot of uh, stress at work, maybe you had um, a lack of sleep and all these different things. So I think it really just has to tie into driving factors that are inflammatory and are not driving factors that are inflammatory and driving more factors that are inflammatory. Because the reality is that with people with autoimmune conditions, they're really, really susceptible to these types of things. Because for one, if you do like your typical blood work on a autoimmune patient, what you'll see is that their white blood cell markers are typically depressed. And the reason for that is because people with autoimmune conditions, they have this suppressed immune system. So now they're really, really susceptible to a lot of different things. So let's say, for example, during cold and flu season, they have to be very, very diligent about not only, you know, doing their exercises or, you know, exercising, making sure that they get enough sleep, making sure they're not excessively stressed, you know, hang, uh, staying true to their diet and their supplementation and stuff like that, because now they're really, really susceptible to getting that cold and flu versus somebody like myself, or maybe you is like, I've never, I don't think I've ever had the cold or, or had a flu. And, you know, with that, I, I don't think I've ever gotten a flu shot either. And so, you know, I, I don't have an autoimmune condition either. And so this is something else too, that you don't really realize. And this is something that's been really eye-opening for me because like, I'm now in the process of like looking for a new office space and where I want to build out my next one. And so there's a lot of different things like, like for example, um, glues and carpets or fire retardants, like on new furniture, those can be triggers for autoimmune patients. And so now for me, as somebody that's about to like embark on this journey of like figuring out how do I want to build out my new office and how does this, you know, what is this going to flow like? Well, I'm not going to have carpets because I, if, if I continue down this path of working with autoimmune conditions, hopefully I end up getting better and better. And with that, I'll probably end up attracting more and more difficult cases. And so with that, I now have to play in my head and say, well, I don't want to have carpets and I don't want to have these fire retardant things because they could be triggers. Or another thing that could be a trigger is like someone like myself who doesn't have an autoimmune condition, I can walk into an old building 
and not feel anything, right? But for someone with a chronic autoimmune condition, they may walk into that building and it's got a little bit of mold in it. They feel it immediately. And so that's another thing that I had to take into consideration is like, I can't be in a real old building, right? It's just like all these different things that you don't think about. But now that you know, it's like, okay, now I got to take that into consideration when making this next move, you know? Yeah. But at the end of the day, it's to the patient's benefit. So right. uh, it's all, yeah, but a lot to consider a lot, not only, like you said, just the carpet, the floors, the, the yeah. type of building, the age, yeah. uh, aerosols in the building and things like that. So yeah. Cleaning products. Exactly. Um, all of that is, uh, has to be considered. Um, say I'm a patient listening to this or a potential patient or somebody who's been struggling for a little while and right. really vibing so far um, with what uh, has been said. Well, I guess, let me, let me rephrase this. So if someone has an autoimmune condition, we also want to consider what they might be experiencing from uh, a brain brain aspect, right? So mm -hmm. what are some common symptoms that might maybe overlap with your typical neuro patient and your typical maybe autoimmune patient? Great question. And then discerning those two. <clears throat> Great question. Um, for one, like we talked about before, is when you get to the really severe end of things, you could have things like gluten ataxia or neuromyelitis optica, but on the more like functional range of like the patients that we see presenting at our office is a lot of people will present with like brain fog. Um, brain fog is really important because um, brain fog and just like cognitive issues in general fatigue and stuff like that, because what can happen with an autoimmune condition is let's say that you have breakdown of your gut barrier. Well, breakdown of your gut barrier also leads to breakdown of your blood brain barrier. And so now this inflammation can get in there and you can get neuroinflammation and it can lead to all these different types of uh, cognitive issues and stuff like that. So I think that would probably be the most um, common thing that makes me think, oh, this person probably has a breakdown of their blood brain barrier. And it's, you know, and that's really, really scary too, because whenever that happens, now they can start developing antibodies towards their neurologic tissue. So I have a guy that I'm working with right now. He lives up in Denver um, and he was diagnosed with ALS. And so his, his symptoms are progressing really, really quickly. And I was like, dude, you, we, we need to do some testing and see like, do you have breakdown of your blood brain barrier? Um, he, first off, he was diagnosed with ALS off of um, by a neurologist up there. And it was just based off of uh, initial history. That's all they did. And then told him, you have three months left to live and there's, there's nothing you can do. I'm just like thinking to myself, I'm not saying that the doctor's wrong. They might be hundred percent, right? They might be able to just like smell ALS as soon as it walks in the door. But for me, if I was going to give somebody a diagnosis like that and give them, you know, not very long to live, I would have some hard hitting evidence to back my opinion. Right. And so I'm like, I don't know if, if we can, you know, uh, put this into remission or not, but I would like to do some testing and see if you have breakdown of your blood brain barrier. And maybe you have like antibodies towards like myelin basic protein or, you know, all these different things that could lead to um, symptoms like that. And there's actually been a lot of studies talking about how in the early stages of celiac disease, um, it may mimic ALS. And so it's like, you know, who knows? We'll find out. I haven't got the results yet back yet though. We'll see. Yeah. Well, good luck to him. And I'm, he's, yeah. in, he's in good hands. So yeah. Um, Dr. Shem, we are coming in on, uh, our time here. Uh, okay. is there anything that you want to add anything we haven't touched on quite yet that you want to make sure our audience, uh, is aware of? I just kind of want to leave you with hopefully in this presentation, I've been able to get across the fact that this really is a personalized game and there really is no, if anybody is telling you that they're for one curing autoimmune disease, they don't know what they're doing. And then two is that there is no, no, you know, fast cure or, or, or fast progress towards this. And it's really just a trial and error game because one person may react to, let's say, cigarette smoke, a lack of sleep and missing meals, which could be lead to like poor blood sugar regulation. And another person may uh, react to not exercising an argument with their spouse an accidental gluten exposure and the particular uh, food coloring green. So you just, you never really know, right? And so <clears throat> it's just this trial and error game. And so I think one of my favorite quotes is by a guy named Claude Bernard. And he says that in science, 
the thing is to modify and change one's ideas as science advances. And so I'll just kind of leave you with, if you are seeing somebody for an autoimmune condition and they're one of those people that's just kind of putting you on this really restrictive diet and giving you a bunch of supplements, that person has not modified and changed their ideas as science advances. So I would hope that if Joe and I were to do this podcast a year from now, and we did it on the same topic, that my ideas would be shifted because there's new advances in science, right? And so I just kind of want to leave you with that. That's what I would say. Yeah, that's that's a great, great piece of wisdom. I know a lot of people can probably resonate with uh, what you just said there. And that's cool. that's a very true, we always need to be advancing as new developments come and perfectly said. Um, if someone wanted to get in touch with you, follow yeah. you, seek your care, how would they go about doing that? Yeah, so you can find me at Peak Brain Performance Centers on everything. Um, and if you really liked this talk, I try to put out uh, YouTube videos on like smaller topics and dive a little bit deeper um, on YouTube every week. I try to do that. Um, being kind of busy, it's kind of hard to you know do it every week, but that's what I kind of like to do. So if you liked this talk, you probably like that. Um, if you want to get in touch with me, you can go onto my website and schedule a phone call with me. Um, other than that, you know, Peak Marine Performance Center, you can find me everywhere. Perfect. Perfect. Be sure to follow him. He's got great content. And uh, yes. Thanks, Joe. So thanks, Dr. Shem, for coming on today. It's uh, been a pleasure. Fantastic information that you shared with our audience today. I think a lot of people are going to really benefit from this information in particular. Uh, so it was great. Thank you. Cool. Thank you so much, Joe. Yeah. This has been your host from the Neuro Wellness Podcast. Be well. <laughs>